All right, hello and welcome back to Rebound with Resilience, a podcast dedicated to raise your resilience, mindset and mental wellness. And on today's episode, wow, I'm so excited because uh, I have a friend and uh, a psychologist with me, Brian Poe. Hi, Brian, you want to say hi? <laughs> hello, Kevin, and hello to all the audiences. Thank you right. for being here. Right. Yes, yes, we're looking forward, definitely. So just a quick introduction of, of Brian. Uh, we met last year because he spoke at an event that I was hosting to raise resilience in kids. Uh, right? It was a talk conducted for parents. And yeah, he, he's someone that's very charismatic, very eloquent. And he has uh, appeared on uh, the radio and also wrote a couple articles for uh, major news outlets as well. So definitely looking forward to learning from you. Very Look forward okay. to uh, learning from each other. Yep. Yes, yes, <laughs> for sure. So yes, just let me introduce the outline of today's podcast, right? Especially for parents today, I think this will be very relevant because we're talking about how to build resilience in kids, and how to look out for their mental health and wellness because this is a topic of increasing concern. If you are a student, regardless, right, this, you will still learn something from this. Or you could send this podcast to your parents as well. That's <laughs> my what? Actually, maybe I'll share a little bit about yourself. You know, what led you to this field? You know, how long have you been practicing? And of course, the views that you express are not tied to any organization, right? It's your own. That's important to mention. Yeah, so go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I'm, working in, uh, I'm working in a hospital, okay? okay. Uh, and I'm, I see uh, adolescents age. I also see some children, uh, but mostly teenagers. And, and the, their main problems are anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and mm. uh, stress. And, and these are the common problems that they face. And I talk okay. to them. I do therapy with them, okay? okay. And try to help them through sure. talking. And what led you into this field initially? Let me ask. Whoa, okay. Um, I mean, this field for more than 10 years already. Right? Okay. okay. And what led me into this field? I studied psychology. And I'm always interested in mental disorders and how, how these disorders that seemingly doesn't have any physical manifestation can cause so much dysfunction to people. And, and I'm always curious about that. So I studied and then I, I, I went into the field and I enjoyed this uh, working with people, with people who, has, who suffers from mental illness. Yep. Sure. And then he- but what keeps you going? I mean, I presume that it's, it's difficult. It's difficult work, right? Because it's not, not easy to take on the burdens of, of people and uh, coach mm. them and guide them and help them to frame their, their mindsets. But mm. perhaps I could ask what keeps you going uh, all these years? What keeps me going? Uh, I think like any other professions, mm. you need to have uh, a certain degree of passion if you want to last long in right. that job. And uh, every job has its pros and cons. And like mm. you say, there's a lot of emotional, uh, I guess, burden in mm. my field. But at the same time, I see it as a privilege to be able to uh, have patients share with me their, their problems. So okay. it's uh, also how you look at it, okay? the anger at which you look, look at the job as well. But I truly believe that to last long, you need to have passion for the job. And you need to constantly refresh your passion, okay, and always remind yourself uh, why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an excellent reminder, even for myself or in general, for anybody that's in a field, uh, we don't take time to reflect on why we started or sometimes it gets a little bit heavy lah, in that sense. Yeah, so we are going to move on into, now that the audience has known more about your passion and, and what drives you, you know, and I would say personally as well, speaking to Brian, a couple of times over the last year, right? he's someone that's very humble and very sincere in his sharing. You know, I've learned so much from him actually. You know, he's so, he's so honest and so gracious in, in, in interacting with me, even though I'm just a, a guy just doing my podcast. So yeah, definitely looking forward to, to learning from you. Uh, because we are going to talk about resilience and mental wellness in kids, right? And so I think it helps for the audience. It helps us. It helps for us to define the terms for the audience. Uh, in your understanding, what is resilience and what is mental wellness? 
I guess in my opinion, I think yeah. resilience uh, in, in psychological terms, lah, I know resilience can be in many engineering terms, but sure. I think in psychological terms, it's really about the process of being uh, able to adapt okay, in the face of adversity, trauma, or, or negative things that has happened, okay, or different kinds of stressors. It can be uh, relationship issues, family issues, uh, health problems, uh, school problem, uh, workplace problem, financial mm. problem, any kind of problems that uh, the person goes through and yet able to adapt well and able to survive and not only survive, thrive in that kind of situation. And I will call that resilience. Okay. Uh, and and from from there you can see resilience requires that adverse events. Okay, so mm. you can't have resilience with a uh, very smooth sailing life. Basically, you are not tested. Okay, sure. so so that's resilience. Mm. Okay, and mental wellness. Mm. Mental wellness, as in the definition. Yeah, or rather, some an idea lah. Doesn't need to be a fixed definition. To me, what mental wellness is uh, not just the absence of mental illness. Okay, I think uh, mental wellness consists of uh, resilience as well and the ability to, uh, I guess, be able to fight against mental illness. So, uh, and you can be mentally ill, yet you have some kind of mental wellness. Sure. So even for people with depression, you can see different kinds of suffering, different kinds of adaptation. And they are people with depression. Yes, they have low mood and all the symptoms, but they are able to bounce back and they are able to, I guess, uh, show resilience despite having uh, these problems. So mental wellness is something, uh, you know, it's something like health, with physical health. Mm. Okay, you can be very healthy, yet you get cancer or yet you get some kind of physical illness, but you, you still try your best to be healthy. Sure. And it goes the same for mental or psychological wellness. Okay, you, you, you try to build up that wellness. And so it will, I guess, uh, protect you from getting many illness. Sure. And, and even if you get many illness, you can bounce back, uh, I guess, more readily and uh, come back stronger than before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think what you said about how resilience is only developed in testing it's it's when you have that failure only then can you learn the ability the techniques the strategies to deal with that failure and become stronger and become wiser in that sense um so i would say that you answered the second question as well which is why i was going to ask you like why is resilience important for kids especially you know why is it a priority for parents to care for the mental health and wellness of their kids Perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on that. With that, I always uh, like to, uh, I always think of these terms, strawberry generation. Okay. <laughs> and when you, and, and this term is widely thrown at our newer generations, la, mm. referring to them as this fruit, which if you know strawberry, if you buy them before, yeah. they get rotten very easily. <laughs> okay. And they get soft very easily. They are quite, so, okay, so, so this is the, the, the term that is used to describe, okay, and it's usually used by older generations on the yeah. younger generations, okay? And I, I think the reason why is because uh, maybe the older generations uh, feel that they have gone through more hardship. Okay. If, okay, uh, and, and, and it's uh, probably so because if you go back in history, uh, things are generally harder la, in the past yeah, of course. and things get easier now, okay, uh, objectively. Mm. Uh, but also, that, that is the term to describe people who give up easily, okay, who cannot take hardship and then they give up. So, so, so they use this term. And uh, to, to be honest, I don't think it's a fair term. I do okay. think that our youth do face hardship, but yeah. in different forms. In sure. different forms. So uh, they might not have that kind of, I guess, you know, uh, n not enough food to eat, no shelter, that kind yeah. of uh, physical hardship, or they need to uh, walk long distance to school. Okay, mm -hmm. but they have a new kind of stresses okay, that can include uh, dealing with uh, the very fast technological uh, transmission of information, okay, okay. Uh, the social media. 
uh, and, and, and these are things that I think is a new form of stress that the older generations might not have gone through before. Okay? Mm. Cyber bullying on a uh, bullying on a cyber scale. That's something new. Okay, so um, so I think for every gener- generation, they do have their own hardship and adversity, and uh, and 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 to be able to overcome that is a kind of resilience, and yeah. I I think that's why it's important, even for youngsters today, to be able to I guess um, have the resilience to fight against this kind of stress, okay. different stressors in life. Yeah, yeah. yeah you mentioned. Uh, the, the word different stresses like our generation mm. goes through very different stresses from the past generation we had war yes. we had to fight for a survival in that sense we had to put food in sh- and my, my parents for example had I, I don't know seven or eight siblings you know and the, the amount of food that they eat is a lot less as well and then the mom and dad had to cook for the whole family you know whereas versus now it's of course more financially it's more prosperous but uh, speaking for my uh, people around my age or students that I interact with, like you said, bullying, cyberbullying, social media. In fact, I think there was one study that suggests that the amount of trauma in that sense, right, that they face on a daily basis is a lot. Because, you know, they're exposed to devices and these devices um, expose them to potential sources of stress. Yeah, so I think what you mentioned about, yeah, it's super important to, to know, or rather, for kids to develop the ability to respond to the stressors. But for parents-wise, right, how can they equip themselves to be perhaps uh, more aware of these sources of stress? Okay, perhaps I could ask you, right, for help to help parents be more aware, what are the key sources of stress among the younger, you know, the people that you, you work with, maybe 13 to, to 18 years old? Yep. Okay, I will classify the stress right, mainly from home and from school. Okay, because these are the two main areas that the teenagers is uh, is exposed to. Okay? okay, and home refers to the relationships. Okay, within the family, okay, it can be between the child and the parents and the siblings, or even what they witness. Okay, amongst the adults. Okay, so let's say if the parents have very poor relationship and they fight, mm. this can be a kind of stress. Okay? okay, and there can be financial stressor in the family not enough mm. money or they always argue over money, not enough pocket money, okay? So uh, this is the family part and I think it's largely relationship, okay? And uh, maybe a, also a part on uh, expectations with the parents' expectations on the child's uh, behaviors or academic expectation, okay. which is very common. Uh, so this is the, the part from the family, which uh, family can, of course, look into it, okay? Right. But there's the part that is actually outside of the family, which is school. And this is, uh, the, the, the child spend a huge amount of time in school, if you, if you look at it, okay? At home, they, 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 they sleep eight hours. So the time that they are awake at home is not as much as the time they are awake in school. Okay. And in school, again, there's relationship problem. This could be with friends, okay? Could be uh, being bullied by friends, okay? Poor relationship with friends, having cliques, being ostracized, things like that. Okay, relationship with teachers, okay, maybe they don't like a teacher or they feel a teacher is unfair, okay, with mm. the authorities in school. And uh, that's the relationship part. Of course, that's BGR or GGR or BBR, <laughs> okay, it depends. Okay. Um, that's another angle to look at. Uh, right. And the huge, another huge part of school is academic stress, mm. okay? And na- naturally, when you go to school, what do you have? Tests, exams, assignments, homework projects, group projects, presentations. These, yeah. these things just add on to the stress, uh, CCA. And uh, this is things that uh, they face on a regular basis. Okay, And okay. Uh, I think one of the biggest stressors is really from major exams, PSLE, O-level, A-level, okay. final year exam. Yeah, so that's uh, exams part. And uh, I think that that's that's mainly about it, lah. The the main stressor, and that's a lot already. You yeah, yeah. It. I was he just listening to you, and I just felt that wow, <laughs> that's a whole long list, you know, of things that parents need to watch out for. Would you say that perhaps the first steps would be aware of those stressors, like what are kids, what are their kids even facing in the first place? Uh, definitely, because I think a lot of parents sometimes mm. they um they didn't really look into what the kids are facing in mm. school. 
and, and it's good for them to be aware. Of course, not to uh, micromanage them, sure. uh, but, but of course, it's to be aware and it's good that they can talk to them about it. Okay, have an right. open conversation, like ask them how's school or how's everything. Okay, and, and you're right, the relationship is the most important singular factor. Mm. Because with a good relationship, the kids are willing to tell you. Yeah. Okay. If you don't build up that kind of open conversation, uh, that kind of psychological safety for the child to say anything, they won't say anything. Even if they have a lot of problems, they will just keep it to themselves. So I think that's something important for parents to take note. That is from sure. young, build, build a good relationship with your child. Um, I know it's a difficult thing to do because right. if you are too easy on them, like friend, friend like that, Sometimes they might not uh, have that kind of respect which a lot of parents want to have. Yeah. Okay. But if you become the overly strict kind of parents that we mm. see in uh, our our times or our sure. parents' times, then that's when they will fear you. Mm. And, and and that's another problem. Okay. So so you need to build that balance that you are a parent who can you can talk to. Yeah. But you're still a parent. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that is difficult, right? We're not saying that that's easy because I must imagine that that's super difficult for a parent because they have their own stresses as well to deal with, you know, outside of their, their kids, mm. they have their work, mm. putting food on the table. Sometimes that can translate into the communication with their kids as well. You know, but mm. of course, you know, this podcast is about optimism and it's about helping us to improve. Mm. Yeah, so... Mm. Um, what are some mentioned being aware right, building relationship with their kids, right? What are some tips that you know parents can can do? Or maybe before that, what are some points of conflict that you observe in your of course without naming names, right? But you observe in your experiences, what are some points of conflict between parents and kids? Okay, I think one point of conflict is re- really the expectations of okay. parents on their child. And uh, sometimes parents have very high expectations and, and, and that sh- stresses out the child. Mm. And the other point of conflict is really the, this word called freedom. <laughs> okay? mm. this, this can be a huge topic okay? Okay. in itself. Okay? Whether the, the parents give enough freedom to the child. Mm. And uh, th- this is a very hard thing to control because it's, uh, it evolves with the child's development. Mm. So imagine when the child is young, and you allow the child to have his or her own handphone and use it as he, he or she likes. Mm. Okay? And then one day you feel that, oh no, uh, he's addicted to gaming right. or addicted to social media and you want to take away that phone. Right. Okay? Just imagine if the yeah. child is already 16 okay? and you try to take away the phone that you have given when, since he's 6 years old. Right. Do you think it's something that can be done? It's... It's difficult. Very, very hard. Yeah. Yes. That would be a, a mess, a huge argument. Okay. Sure. So that's something that to consider. Because when I think during our times it's very straightforward. No handphone, no handphone. But as as we go along, right, in modern days, right, it's it's getting harder. Okay. Last mm-hmm. time I hear people say, Oh no, you can only have handphone when you reach uh university. Okay, that's my time. Oh, that's then crazy. slowly to think how much she has changed. <laughs> yeah, but but it's okay for my times. There wasn't um. Of course, yeah. They're still using pager, you know. Okay. So, <laughs> so so it's a bit different. Then then I see it getting earlier. Then now JC or Poly, and then now oh secondary must baseline yeah. must have phone. And now recently I heard they say oh primary school should have phone. Yeah, primary so, five, primary six, four, they really have. Yeah. For some is primary one. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so really why, why is the then? It's really insane. Yeah. It's like they can access the internet. They're exposed again to so many stresses. Um, but yeah, they- yes, right. that's, that's a different topic. Yeah, but but it's really hard. If it's me, I would say maybe after secondary school. Secondary mm. school is the youngest they can go. Okay. Yeah, but if if you tell many of the kids this, I'm sh- I'm sure the primary school kids will rebel against yeah <laughs> against me, right? Yeah. So so I think it's difficult. Uh, Especially when the child grows up, you want to be a, a supportive parent, but okay. yet you know that there are some things that uh, might not be so called the right future, sure. but yet your child wants. Okay. okay? Oh, a lot. Uh, 
A lot, yeah. So, <laughs> so I've seen uh, sometimes students saying they want to uh, be a professional gamer. So mm-hmm. if you're the parent, will you agree to that? <laughs> or they want to be a K-pop artist? Because they, they have a lot of idols, right? Then they see, yeah. they see, okay, next time that's my job. Okay. Sure. Or I want to be a YouTuber. Okay? okay. PewDiePie earns a few million a year. I want to be PewDiePie. Okay. So, as so what parent, would I say, right? So what would I say? Yeah. Um, imagine what would you say? I'm a parent. How would I advise you? Yeah. Oh, that's difficult, man. That's difficult. <laughs> I think I would, I would say, um, get act together. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I won't say that. I won't say that. I would say, you know, um, I ask them why. Help understand maybe where that comes from, where that thought comes from. And then explain to them that perhaps they're seeing one side of it, but you also need to see the work behind it. And then I help them, maybe direct them to see the other side of things. Lah. And then from there, yeah, then from there we see how it goes. See if they still want to pursue oh. it or not. Yeah. That's good. That's good. You didn't, you didn't completely shut down the idea. I think that's good. That's right. great. Because a lot of parents will have instinctively say, wake up idea, lah. go and study. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> And then, okay. and then you know, you know what? They won't tell you anything anymore, mm. and they continue to secretly do their YouTube behind the scene. Right. So, so it's good that you keep it open. So that's one tip, right? Especially, I think, thing for parents also is not to immediately shut their kids down and impose their values, uh, but to empathize in that sense, like why are they having their thought? And and I think if I may share one story, right? If it also could help listeners as well. I remember a, a, a mentor or a senior of mine, right? She is very into working with special needs kids. So there was one time she was arguing with her parent, right? Over whether to send a kid for testing. Because in her mind, right? You shouldn't label and send a kid for testing so fast, right? Because they label them and then they act according to the label. So they were arguing, they're arguing, right? And then her mentor, a senior in the organization came in. And the moment she came in, she saw the argument. She said that, okay, don't worry. We'll send your kid for testing. She told the parent. So, of course, the parents were happy, right? The parents left. And then my friend actually asked the mentor, hey, how come you, you do this? You know, don't you know that, you know, it will eventually be bad for the kid? So, the mentor should say something to her, right? Which she shared with me. I found it such good advice. She said that she did that because she wants to gain influence with the parent. You know, and if she gains influence with the parent, right? After that, when she has influence, she can advise them accordingly. But if the moment she shut down the parent, right, and say, no, you can't do this, then you lose influence, the parent is going to do it somewhere anyway. I thought, man, that was such a good analogy. For me, even coaching, working with my students or working with the people I coach or even parents working with uh, their kids as well. Yeah, so um, I just hope that the story can add value lah, to the parents. It does, it does. Nice story. I, I yeah. like the story. I appreciate yeah. that, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's a nice story. So it teaches us that... Uh, it's more important to get the food in the door first. And sometimes to do that, you might even need to go against what you felt is right. Mm. Sometimes retreating is progressing in the long run. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so, uh, yes, and on that topic as well, right? I, I just thought mm. a little bit of research into parenting styles. And I think the last time we were discussing about this as well, like, you know, on one side, it's a completely, like you said, shut them down. On the other mm. side, it's like, hey, you know, Johnny, you can do anything you want. <laughs> go ahead. As a Western star, right? Like, okay, go and be a K-pop star, you know, just go and do your YouTube, whatever you want to explore, just explore. And that, in a sense, may not be, be fully uh, uh, desirable as well, like, you know, for the kid. So if I could share, right, maybe just the parenting styles and just let me know if I get anything off or anything wrong. But this is from research and from the most common parenting style matrix that is used. Like. Mm. I think, the, yeah, you send this to me as well. So this, uh, for parents listening to this, right, you can Google it. It's called Parenting Styles, but it's a quadrant. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, just visualize it. You can draw a quadrant. And there are two axes. Uh, so the first axis is warmth. Uh, so how warm you are to your, your kids, you know, whether you support them and whether you listen to them, that's warmth. And the other axis is control, which means that how much control you demand on them, you know, how much restriction you place on them. So for a parent with very high warmth and very high control, we call that authoritative parenting, which means that they're demanding or rather they set limits, but at the same time, they also give kids autonomy and they're warm and responsive as well. They still listen and they guide them. Yeah, so that's the first one. If let's say your warmth is low, 
that means you don't really uh, have conversations with your kids, but your control is high, then it's authoritarian, which means they're very demanding punishment, threats, right? Your kids have very little autonomy. So there's a second one. Now, third one is that if your warmth is low and your control is low, this is called the rejecting, neglecting parenting, which means they are disengaged. You know, you don't set limits, you're not responsive. And usually these are kids that you see sometimes that, you know, I also talk to that. They just left on their own uh, devices sometimes. And the last one is actually permissive parenting, which means that the warmth is very high and the control is very low. So they're very nice. Like you said, like Johnny, you know, they can do anything you want and stuff like that. But that in itself, when there's no limits, could also have some challenges. Uh. So I hope that when you listen to this, you can also reflect on, on the parenting style that you have. And studies also show that the most, the study show that the most successful parenting style in raising academically strong and stable kids, right, are the authoritative parenting style. Yeah, whereas uh, others may not be, yeah, uh, may lead to certain psych- uh, psychological um, challenges as well. So, of course, that being said, right, it's a mix. Lah. It's always dependent on the context. You want to get the best of everyone and then see which is suitable for your kids. Yeah, so I hope that, uh, that, that I just shared that. Uh, is that any, is that okay, Brian? Yeah, yeah that's, that's really good. It also refreshes my, my memory about learning this. Yeah. Uh, so, so high warm, high control. That's the, that's the ideal. Uh. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I think it also varies with context, varies with time. Mm. So, uh, I, I think warm should always be high. But uh, yeah. the control should uh, should taper off as they grow older. Right. That yeah. Makes sense. Okay. And until when they reach adult, it's, it's, it's of basically course. don't really control them much anymore. Okay. Yeah. I understand that. But still be warm. <laughs> and so yeah, I think that that's, that concludes our discussion on parenting style. Perhaps we could move a little bit into uh, resilience specifically, right? Like um, how can parents build resilience in their kids? I think uh, since you mentioned about parenting style, there's also this um, parenting style called over controlling parenting. Okay, mm. not not exactly on that quadrant, but uh, this kind of parenting style refers to parents who uh, tend to micromanage mm. and uh, over control. And the reason why they do so uh, mainly is because they want to protect their child. They mm. don't want them to. I guess, uh, make the wrong move or get into trouble or, right. or, or, or suffer from bad decisions. Okay. So, and, and what they do is that they control everything that the, the child does, like uh, whether it's doing homework or whether it's it friends, going out to meet friends. They tend to control a lot. Mm. And studies have shown that this kind of parenting style uh, can lead to uh, higher levels of anxiety. Okay, because um, for example, if you learn that you can't do this, it's dangerous. The world is a dangerous place. Eventually, you'll be uh, you develop this internal mindset that the world is dangerous, and you, you might get a bit more anxious mm. when you are tasked to do things on your own without your parents. Okay, and uh, and that also doesn't help with resilience building. Okay, because as we defined earlier, resilience is the the ability to adapt. To adversity, to, to adverse situations, and when you overprotect your child, uh, then how do they get the opportunity to meet any kind of adversity, and how do they develop any resilience then? Mm. So, parents to think about it lah. Whether have you been overly protective? Again, it's a it's a time. There's a time context. Okay, when they are baby, of course you protect them. Okay. They, yeah. They might fall off the table or something. Yeah. Okay. But but when they are 18, do you mm-hmm. still look make sure that they 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 don't walk the wrong direction or or do mm. they still micromanage them? So so it depends. Okay, I, there's no right or wrong answer, but the general consensus is that as they grow older, uh, let go a bit more. Okay. Uh, but that also depends on how much you trust trust them now okay sure. so so there's no hard and fast rule on this yeah okay and preparing right it's about preparing them and not protecting them so you know you mm. don't want to protect overly put our helicopter parenting like we call it you know always hovering oh, over yeah. the kids that's, that's a term <sighs> yeah 
and uh, and because of that, like you said, we the kid will never learn to be independent nor make independent decisions, which yeah. is absolutely crucial like, in the working life or yeah. in just relationships and solving problems. Yeah, yeah. so uh, but why is it so difficult for parents? And do you have any advice for parents who find it very difficult to, to let go, right? Is there one or two things or mindsets they can, they can kind of perspectives you can give them to help them with this? I think the reason why they cannot let go is because they love their child too much mm. and they are afraid that harmful things happen to them. Sure. So, uh, but it's also for them to think about how they are also harming them in an indirect way yeah. if they don't let go. Okay? Right. And if they love them, they have to learn to let them so-called uh, go through some kind of adversity. Okay? Uh, and, and you said you say it very well, to prepare them, okay? So not completely letting go and don't care about time. Yep. Okay, that's the other extreme, okay? Yeah. The other, other end. The neglecting, and we want to, right? Rejecting, neglecting style. Yes. Don't care. Okay. We don't want to swing into that kind of neglecting parenting where you don't really care. So you still can care, okay? But one advice I can give is that don't give advice. <laughs> okay. Okay. So 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 don't give advice. Okay. Because uh, when you give advice, it's basically giving them the answer. Okay. okay. So you imagine they do assessment book and you give them an answer where they learn. Mm. They don't learn. Yeah. Uh, they just copy only. Uh. Mm. So what you want to do is to discuss with them, and if they really don't have a solution, then brainstorm options together and let them. Let them this talk about the option that they will choose eventually, right. the pros and cons. Uh, go through with them if they can. So it's it's a bit of like guidance kind of thing. You guide them, okay, but don't give them the answer. Sure. <laughs> At least not immediately. Okay. Got it. Don't, don't jump to give them the answer. Okay. So uh so so one example is that the child might ask, uh, should I choose this course or that course? Okay, you know, sometimes they go secondary school or it can be a CCA, it can be a course, it can yep. be uh, something that they have to make a decision. Mm. So some parents will have their own, uh, I guess it's their own own idea of what is good, what is bad. They'll jump in, oh, take science, don't take art. Science yeah, can yeah. make money, art can make money. You know, you mm. hear this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, join this CCA, don't join the CCA because this one is better. Uh, politics, political club is better than art club. Okay, whatever. Okay, okay. Just, <laughs> just an example. Sure. So, but instead of saying that, why don't you give them, um, ask them, like, which one do you prefer? What, what is the subject combi that you like? Uh, you like history uh, uh, and don't like bio. Can you tell me more? And yeah. then after that, they make a decision that, oh, I really want to do humanities or arts. Then that's where it's their choice, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you try to stop them, then that's where you fall into that over-controlling kind of thing again. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah my I advice really... mm, is Go that ahead. if the decision is not um immoral, illegal, or unethical, cause any unethical or harm, mm. potential harm to the child or others, uh, just let them try. Even if you okay. don't think it's the best choice, just let them try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. You know why God was was that number one. Understand that by protecting them, you might be harming them. And helping parents to realize if you really want to help your kids, right, you have to let go at a certain point or give them a more autonomy to make their decisions because ultimately the outcome you want is what you're going to get if you do that. And how we do that, right, is by guiding and coaching. Right? So along the way from, when they're, of course they're young, you need to direct them more. But as you grow older, you have to guide them. You know, give them questions, ask questions, clarify their thinking, help them to make balanced decisions and independent responsible decisions yeah mm. don't shut them yep. down because of your own values or thinking of what is right and wrong yes. so yeah thank you thank you so much for that i think i think we've covered that uh okay great that's wonderful so we talked about we have talked about parenting styles we talked about building resilience in youth i guess maybe we want to move on to the last part of the podcast which is more of uh, strategies to cope with stress uh, and before that, so sorry, I forgot one thing. Before that, how can parents look out for the mental health of their kids? Mm. Yeah, that's okay, important. So, mm. like I said earlier, right, uh, 
you need to know your kids well. Okay, you need to have that kind of relationship. And uh, things to observe is basically um, their emotions and their behaviors, which uh, which might manifest if their emotions have some changes. Mm. So, for example, if they look very low mood, or they lost their motivation, or they complain that they don't want to go to school, mm. or they, they get sick a lot, or, or they will just show any abnormal behaviors that is not the usual baseline, then you, right. need, to, you need to watch out. Maybe something is not right. Yeah, okay. whether is it they're sleeping or they're even their appetite changes, or whether is it their energy level become very low or too high. Uh, you 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 basically you know them well first to know the changes. Right. Yeah, and yeah. if you see the changes, that's where you want to do something about it. If, depending on how bad the thing is, like if you're one day your child just don't want to go to school, I uh, don't want to go to school, keep crying. Then yeah, then obviously something is not right, and mm-hmm. then you need to have some intervention for that. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, and the keyword the keyword you mentioned is is baseline, right? What you need to know what's the baseline behavior or 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 the thoughts, actions. And any deviation from that could be an indication of poor mental health or you know stresses that they might face that is too overwhelming for them. And to do that, to understand again goes back to parenting styles, you know, goes back to you know about warmth and everything kind of ties together, huh? I would say very nicely. Yeah, so again, I hope, really, I hope Brian's advice uh, helps you if you're listening to this podcast. Um, definitely about being observing, having empathy, and knowing like, what your kid's baseline is. Great. So, yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, we're going to move on to the final part of the podcast, which is more of strategies to cope with stress. So if you're listening to this as a student or even as a parent, I think this is relevant to everybody. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, we're going to move on to the final part of the podcast, which is more of strategies to cope with stress. One or two questions, right? What is stress actually? What is stress defined as? And is it necessarily bad? Stress usually refers to these um, external changes, okay, that uh, causes you to have some discomfort. Mm. Okay, and it could be uh, some difficulties in your life or extra work or upcoming exams okay? okay it can be anything that uh causes you to uh your body to react okay right because uh it's either you want to do well in that thing or, or there's some expectation on you okay uh you need to care to feel stress that's what i always think okay if you mm-hmm. don't care you don't stress right but but as humans we do have things that we care a lot okay and if you look at students it would be their schoolwork they, they want to do well or projects or relationships they want to be liked by by, by their friends right. so these are things that causes stress uh, one thing about stress is that it's not all bad okay so mm. if you look at stress on a on the cur- bell curve right it's actually a bell curve in terms of uh, uh, stress to performance okay so in fact with some amount of stress right you will you will force yourself to do something about it. Okay, you have some kind of increase in performance sure. up to this peak performance, where then it goes down here when the stress gets uh, increasing. Okay, increasingly high. We call that positive stress U stress, and the mm-hmm. negative stress distress. Okay, I see. Okay. And, and stress itself is basically your body preparing for uh, some future. Okay, what is it danger? or future things that you need to attend to. Right. So, so it is really not something that is purely bad as what most people would uh, classify this, the word stress as. Mm. The yeah. feedback, right? The emotions are feedback telling you that, okay, you care enough about this thing to be stressed about it. And like, you want to mm. get it done, then you have to do something about it yes. in that way it pushes yes. you forward. But I think what you mentioned about you stress and distress is, is, is something new that I learned also. Um, so where, where is that, that line between you stress and distress? I know it's a tough question, but uh, it's yeah. Where is that line for people to know in themselves, right? When they start to get distressed, it's it's a hypothetical line. There's right. no clear line. Okay, so let me post you this example. Uh. Let let's play a game. Okay, so you have a sure, rubber I love band. Games. Okay, so so if you have a rubber band and the mm. and the aim for you is to make the rubber band as long as possible, what will you do? You will win if it's the longest. Right. I get where you're going with this question. So well, where, what will you do? 
I will stretch, stretch it, it. Like, very carefully. So at the maximum, right, I will be more careful. Because <laughs> I'm yes. afraid of a snack. But you will not know what is the maximum. Yeah, I will not know. Yeah, you will think yeah, I can go a bit more. Just one micrometer more. Mm. It will be better. Okay, and pull, 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 pull. So, so I don't suggest you try to reach the max because you will know when is it, and it's very dangerous. You might mm-hmm. snap. Okay, and uh, yeah. in a, this analogy is to someone who has a mental breakdown because mm. he or she pushes too hard himself too hard, and right. then and then you pull and snap. And what happened? The rubber is very short. Okay, you lost everything. <laughs> so don't get to that point. Okay, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think it's a very important reminder. It's also for us to be aware la, like when that breaking point is or when you are going to... Like you say, sometimes it's very difficult. You know, in my experience as well, you know, at my A-levels, right, I couldn't see it coming. I mean, there were signs, la, but when it happened, it was it was like you said, la, a breakdown. And then from there, it spiraled down. Of course, I'm so fortunate to be able to overcome it, but it took me months. Months, almost close to a year. So I can understand your analogy perfectly. Yeah. And, and I would say that, you know, are there any nicks or tips you give to people to, to reduce uh, stress or at least relieve stress, right, in the process of striving? I think the most uh, direct way is, of course, to know what your stressor is and mm. deal with it directly, okay? So it is about a test whether mm. you can study and uh, prepare yourself, okay? Or if it's an interview, Mm. or presentation whether you can really work on making that thing more I guess more confident about facing that thing Mm. okay but of course the other angle to look at it is how you want to look at that that thing okay whether it's exams or interview if you can change your mindset okay lower your expectation okay it might also uh, relieve some of the stress okay but there are things that it's very hard to I guess lower expectation for example, if it's your O levels, okay, and you're worried about it, uh, I wouldn't say uh, just tell yourself that I have passed Kennedy mm. because it might affect your future. Sure. Okay. But at the same time, maybe not to think so extreme, like I must get all A. Right. Okay. So so a way to moderate is to tell yourself, uh, maybe this top school is my aim. Okay. But what if I don't get do so well? I still can go to the second tier uh, mm. goal. Okay, so set different goals so that it won't okay. be that kind of, you know, that all or black nothing. Or white. It's a, black or white black thinking, or white. all or nothing, right? Yes, yes this is a thinking yes. that, that caused me to actually go into depression, actually. Yes. I had that. Yeah, I get you. Okay. Mm. And, and type yeah, A person. And of, course, mm, and of course, there are things to do, la, like um, set time to relax yourself. Okay, there's things like uh, you do things that you like, listen to music. Uh, mm. and let's say after you study for one hour, you take a fifteen minutes break. Uh, do things you like. Uh, relationships are important. Talk to friends. Okay, share with them. You can uh, ventilate about the stress. Tell them, oh, there's so much to study. I can't take yeah, it. Yeah. And your friend might say the same thing, and then you, both of you, will feel a bit better that uh. you are not alone. <laughs> yes. Sure. Okay, mm. I mean, yeah, so just identifying what your stress relievers, right? I think everyone would have a couple. Be open to to looking for other means as well to reduce your stress, either online or chatting with your friends. Uh, for some people, it could be their faith. It could be different things like exercise and stuff like that. Yeah, so I think knowing, right? Yeah. And I think knowing, knowing what your stress relievers are, right? and intentionally practicing them is very important um, to, to relieve that stress now. Mm. I, I think one issue that sometimes people one one method that people use mm. is avoidance mm. and that is actually uh, detrimental in the long run okay so for example I have an uh, exam okay yep. I need to study okay but because the stress so much so I tell myself never mind I study tomorrow okay and then and the next day it repeats like, never mind I play this game first this game is more important okay suddenly this game is very important I will play Okay, mm. and then you you try to avoid or you don't even go to school and you try not to think about it, but eventually it comes very close, and then you feel even more stressed. Mm. So, so procrastination, avoidance, these are things that uh, help you in the short term because you get immediate relief, sure. but it causes more stress in the long run. And I don't recommend that you uh, try to avoid things that is difficult. Okay, face them. And and you they usually get better after you face them. 
Yeah. Okay. That's that's fantastic advice for students as well. Because mm. uh you know a, a lot of us avoid, you know, but you like you said, uh, it's it just builds up after that. Yeah, so having that strategy to face it in the present, I think that's important. Right. So thank you so much, Brian, for all your sharing. Uh from parenting okay, styles to to you know parenting tips and of course now coping with stress. I think we are winding, we're gonna wind down and close this podcast. So last question before we close the podcast. Uh, what does resilience mean to you? What does resilience mean to me? Uh? Yeah. Uh, I think it's when you get knocked down nine times, you stand up ten times. That's resilient okay. to me. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, with that, I think it's a perfect ending to this podcast. So thanks once again, Brian, for being with us. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to you and conversing with you. And yes, all of you, I uh, do look forward to the next podcast as well. Until then, stay safe, stay resilient, and I'll see you guys. Bye-bye.